Hello, everyone. Great to see you. Welcome to the Diatom Web Academy, brought to you by the Diatom Taxonomic Certification Committee of the Society for Freshwater Science and diatoms.org. Check out the news page on diatoms.org for the schedule of webinar speakers. You can also watch recordings on our YouTube channel. If you are interested in participating as a speaker or would like to make a suggestion on how we can improve this webinar series, please contact any of the Web Academy organizers. And I will now hand it over to Mark Edlin to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Thank you Sylvia. Yeah, it's my pleasure today to introduce Aga Panofska, who's uh, joining us from Hawaii, which is why we've shifted the time just a little bit. Um, Aga did her, did her graduate work at uh, Bowling Green State University under Rex Lau, where she looked at nutrient limitation effects on algae up at the beautiful Douglas Lake, Michigan. Um, after that, she went uh, and did a couple of postdocs, both, all of them taking place in Florida. Uh, the first at Florida International University, the second with uh, uh, Michigan State University and uh, working with Dan Stevenson working on either paraphyton in the Everglades or spring ecosystems in Florida. After that, her path took her towards the use of algae and bioproduction. Um, she worked for companies in Texas and California and now is at Global Algal Innovations in, um, in, on the island of Kauai in Hawaii. Um, she's gonna tell us a little bit about what she's experienced in nearly 15 years that she's had working in algal bioproduction uh, systems. And thank you, Aga, for, for doing a Diatom Web Academy today. Thank you, it's a pleasure. It's going to be a little bit different talk because it's a talk from the perspective of industry and I can't unfortunately share all the details, but I hope it will be enough to get everybody inspired, kind of what the field needs from the, um, diatomist and phycologist to make it happen. So the idea of uh, growing algae for our biofuels is not new. There was an excellent um, US program, aquatic species program that was funded by DOE and by Jimmy Carter. And many members of this committee were part of this program. And when I started, this was an excellent source for me to kind of figure out what it is all about because I have no idea what it means to grow algae uh, for any kind of a product. Um, this program tested um, over 3000 uh, strains of algae and was primarily focused on finding their right strain that's tolerant of salinity, pH, high temperatures, and uh, mostly growing in saline environments. And the conclusion of this program was that it's probably best to grow in open pond system when you want to grow algae for fuels. So why algae? Um, this is a chart that my current boss put together. It is uh, really good. It shows oil yield per acre or, and protein yield, and unfortunately units are different. Those are uh, metric tons per hectare. Those are gallons per acre per year. The units don't matter. What's important is how much oil and biomass can you produce using traditional, uh, traditional crops like soy, canola, eutropa, corn ethanol, sugarcane ethanol, palm oil that's being very much popularized as a great source of biofuels, cellulitic ethanol, and then algae. So algae are excellent at producing protein. It takes a little more effort to make them produce oil, but even in the current state of technology, um, we can produce a lot of biomass per acre or per hectare. And when we produce a lot of biomass, we're producing protein and we're producing oil. And you can see this is a, not double the production. It's, it's more like compared, and I'll show some more data on it, but it's like at least 10 times the production, if not more. 
So the potential is there, and that's why there was so much interest in um, growing algae in the past. Um, so what's important, algae can, um, algae can use, they use the same amount of water per hectare or per acre when you produce them as any other crop. But what is very important is they produce 40 times more of protein per hectare and 20 tons of oil per hectare compared to the most productive oil plant, which is palm oil, and which can produce 3.3 tons per hectare. And uh, what's very important, if you use the right technology, all media that are using production of algae can be recycled, and there's no surface runoff from the facility. And I'll talk about it a little more. So um, producing algae from, uh, producing oil from algae, producing biofuels from algae, it's not that simple. If it was simple, it would have been done a long time ago. There are a lot of challenges and it requires development of a lot of new technologies. And in the last 15 years, there was a huge progress. A lot of new technologies were developed. Um, we need more to make it economical for biofuels. What's important, alkyl biomass is a multi-use product. You have oil, you have protein, you can have carbohydrates, you can produce fuel, you can produce feed, you can produce polymer. And there are also a lot of specialty products that are coming from algae, uh, different pigments, different, uh, different types of uh, polysaccharides, lots of other compounds that are produced by algae. It's important when you produce biofuels that you process the whole biomass. And it has to be done in the economical way. So um, what taught me working in the algae biofuels is you have to know a lot of other disciplines and um, you have to be aware of them. When I started in algae biofuels, you know, I was a primary biologist thinking as a biologist and it was very difficult for me to communicate with other people who I was working with on different projects and usually work with chemists, you work with a lot of engineers, and on most of the projects I work on, biologists are a minority because there's a huge chemical and engineering component. And um, even though I'm married to an engineer, it's really difficult to communicate with people from different backgrounds. And an understanding what's good data and what's important is very different. So to work in this field, you need biologists. You have to, of course, know something about algae. Uh, aquaculture is becoming a very important component because it looks like the probably first use for algal biomass is going to be mass production of feed for aquaculture. And when I talk feed for aquaculture, it's not growing uh, Ketocera or Thalassiozyra for, for juveniles, but it's producing large amounts of biomass that will be dried, it will be used as um, one of the ingredients to produce feed for aquaculture, like for salmon or for shrimp or for muscle production. Uh, it's also good biomass for animal nutrition. Um, algae have excellent amino acid profile. When you look at it, it's very similar to, feed, to fish. So it's not like a plant protein, but it's more like an animal-based protein. And especially diatoms are very, very good. Some of the diatoms, for example, produce taurine, which is one of those rare animals. People who have cats probably know about it. It has, it's required in the cat diet for the cats to be healthy. You also have some knowledge of chemistry. Um, there is the extraction process, and there is a lot of chemistry involved in developing media for cultivation algae and how to add those media. And um, also media are used as a, a way to transport carbon engineering, all algae production systems that I work with have a huge engineering component. There are a lot of pumps or ponds. If they are grown in photobioreactors, there is a lot of construction of photobioreactors. There's all the system for dosing media, harvesting, drying, and, and eventually storage of biomass after it's harvested. Economics of the process is critical. So we always look at a life cycle analysis and we also always look at the techno-economical analysis. So you always look at your what's happening with all the ingredients, everything you put in and what comes out from the production system and also what's the 
what's the what's the cost so you look at the business perspective you look at capex and opex and capex the cost of construction of algae farm is very very high that's why i don't think we have large farms anywhere yet because it's going to be a, a few hundred million investment to do that so um we currently have commercial algae production and it's excellent because this is a great source for us to get started. Um, but all commercial production of algae right now is for high value products like nutraceuticals. And methodology of cultivation and processing is very expensive because it's produced for human consumption and um, the product is expensive. So there is no huge pressure to make the process more economical there's more pressure on making sure the product is very clean and very safe and if it works you know people just follow the same process so the cost of biomass produce of current commercial farms is around 10 20 dollars per kilogram and the cost has to be around 60 cents to a kilogram to a dollar per kilogram for it to be suitable for biofuel and since it's a diatom uh, group, so um, diatoms are currently cultivated for commercial use. They are cultivated for aquaculture. Um, what we learned very quickly is that strains that are used good for aquaculture, none of them are good biofuel strains. And um, when you cultivate in seawater, you have to directly bubble CO2 to be able to produce large amounts of biomass. And unfortunately, bubbling CO2 is not economically feasible for biofuels. Also, when you cultivate on seawater, you have a problem what to do with the water when you're done with your cultivation process, or you have to discharge the water if you're using seawater to compensate for evaporation, or you have to use fresh water to compensate uh, for the evaporation. So there are two ways of doing it. One is use seawater for the whole process, use uh, seawater to compensate for evaporation, but now you have to discharge this water at the end of the process. Uh, or you use seawater, adds fresh water to compensate for evaporation. Another big problem growing on seawater is that the, the systems that are seawater based are very prone to contamination. And usually you have something that will come and eat everything you're trying to grow. And it happens usually very fast if something comes and wants to eat it. So, um, I'll start going over how the algae farm looks. Um, this is the farm that we have here in Kauai. Uh, it was built by the project that was funded by Department of Defense. It was founded by DARPA. And uh, the military, when it was originally built in uh, 2009, was mostly interested, can you produce oil from algae? And can you make military grade fuels from algae? And the result of this project was uh, the production of 100 liters of highest grade military jet fuel. It's called JP-8. Project was successful. It was of course very expensive. Uh, this farm cost I think over $20 million. And um, when the project was over, this project was, um, so I, at the time I worked for General Atomics when this farm was built. And the project was over, military kind of got their own answer, yes, you can do it. They lost interest in the process. And then what majority of the farming for biofuels started coming from the Department of Energy. So this farm was originally abandoned by General Atomics and my former boss at General Atomics decided he wants to keep working on it and make it happen. And he started the company that I work for right now. So how does the algae farm look? So just to let you know, the farm is supported by a lab. We have a laboratory in a separate location and that's where I primarily work, where we grow inoculum and, and usually we deliver around 60 liters of concentrated inoculum to get the culture going at the farm. Um, once we have it, this inoculum goes into the small side that you can see here. It's scaled up to the system of small ponds. Once you have the large ponds filled out here, you can start moving to the large large facility, you inoculate the smaller spawn, and then eventually from those spawns, you can spread into the farm, whole farm. Uh, so this farm is uh, around seven acres of the wet surface area. And just to let you know, when you look at the economics of the process, 
you need around 300 acres of the wet surface area for the uh, economy to work for the for the biofuels. So we need a much larger farm. This is more like a demonstration and research facility. Um, okay, so algae grow in the ponds. So question number now one is where they're getting nutrients from. Uh, we use just regular fertilizer grade nutrients. They're stored in the barn here. They're added to the ponds. Carbon dioxide comes from the power plant. This is power plant. Uh, there is a pipe that goes from it into the carbonation tower. And we use some um, carbonated media as a way of moving CO2 into the algae. So there is no direct bubbling of CO2. It's very expensive to compress CO2. And once algae are done growing, they're pumped to the harvest station where we have a harvester and a, and a dryer. This site does not produce any oil. It's only set up to produce the biomass. Um, to produce oil, you need uh, some kind of a refinery and it has to be very large scale for the processes to be economical. So just to give you an idea, so I just want to show you there, the, the next picture I'm going to show is a truck that's somewhere here. Uh, truck is little, those ponds are giant, they're absolutely huge. Uh, so now I'm just to say that we also grow uh, diatoms at that farm. And we start from inoculum at the lab, like I was mentioning. So we usually produce 60 liters and then we go to the farm and they are scaled up through the pond system. So can you grow diatoms in those systems? Yes, do. Um, none of them, those are classic aquaculture strains. So what diatoms can you grow? Uh, so far we've been really successful growing nitsias. Uh, and that's pretty much it. We had a few Mayamas when I worked uh, previously in California, but in Hawaii, we only had Nitsias. So why we don't have diatom-based biofuels today? Why don't we have algae-based biofuels today? It's economics and scale. So I know people at some point was very popular, oh, you'll be able to grow uh, algae in your backyard. Everybody can have some slimy water. Um, unfortunately, it's not going to happen, just like you can't grow soy to produce biofuels in your backyard, it's the same with algae. It takes a lot of biomass, um, the biomass has to be maintained in um, high growth all the time. Uh, so when you work at algae farm, uh, you tend to your algae ponds usually two, three times a day, they're constantly monitored, you constantly worry about the weather. and um, at this farm, algae are usually dabbling every two or three days. On really good days, when things are growing fast, uh, they almost double every day. But usually two, three days is on average probably for the whole year. So it means if you have 10 kilograms of algae today, in two, two days, you're going to have 20. So they grow super, super fast. But the process to be economical has to happen on a really large scale. You can't do it in your backyard, unfortunately. This is an older slide. It's an excellent paper in applied energy that looks at the economics of um, algae fuels. And those are the data run from more or less 2011. And they looked at um, oil production and diesel production. So we'll look at diesel and they look at production in open pond systems. So open ponds like this and also in photobioreactors that you know can look like this. There are many options for those. So um, the bottom line, what they were interested in is, you know, what's the cost of production in the open pond system and in the photobioreactors? And it's much more expensive in photobioreactors. I don't think photobioreactors will be economical for production of fuel. And the reason is the cost of construction is very, very high. Um, they have a lot of um, benefits. Uh, usually culture is getting less contaminated when it grows. Uh, in a photobioreactor, um, but they have other problems. And the biggest, the biggest barrier is the cost of construction. So unless somebody comes with a new way of cutting cost of constructions of PBRs, um, I don't think PBR, photobioreactors are going to be the way to make fuels. So around 10 years ago, the cost was around 10, um, over $10 per, uh, per gallon. And uh, we know that 
this cost is probably very down to around six today. Are we at what we pay at the pump? No, but um, I think the development of more technologies will get us there. So let's quickly look at this by when you see what's, where, is, where are the costs coming from. So product, construction of ponds uh, is expensive. It's a big part of your, of your budget. So the capex is really high to get started. And then um, harvesting is expensive. Um, this pie, this part of the pie is getting much smaller. The company I work for developed a new harvest system uh, that's not a centrifuge, that's a filtration system. And it's very, very effective and 100% efficiency so of physically take everything, all the bacteria and all the algae out of the media. So you can completely separate media from the algae. We know the viruses go through, but the algae and bacteria are 100% harvested. So this part got smaller in the last um, 10 years. There are also a lot of new advances in the way to extract, but a lot of them are at this point research scale. So every year, um, Department of Energy and people working on algae biofuels look at the at the cost problem, and they do all this tornado analysis, and they look at okay, if we help with extraction efficiency, how much are we going to save per gallon of um, of biodiesel? And this is changing as new technology are developed. So, for example, the cost of car testing has been has done a lot since we developed this uh, hundred percent efficient system for harvesting. But all those things are important, and usually new new items pop up on this every year. So um, the company I work for is not only looking at the production system and growth, but we also work on extraction. And, and now we're working more and more on what to do with the full biomass. So we're looking at extraction of protein and how to fraction the whole biomass. So you can have multiple streams of products coming from from the biomass. Another thing you have to worry about is, uh, you know, at some point people say you can produce those high value commodity, high value products from algae and then use the rest for the biofuels. You always have to worry about the market size. So market size for human food, market size for animal, animal feed and markets for biofuels are huge. Markets for those specialty products are much smaller. So you have to make sure what you're proposing you'll be producing is matching the reality. So now I'll talk about a little more about the about the research that's going in the biofuels field and what people are really focusing on and what are the critical areas. And I hope many of you are already working in this field and kind of to let people know what's important. So the new big area that everybody's interested in is phycosphere. Um, we had a project, we still have a project where we're looking, we um, used uh, metagenomics to sequence uh, samples from our cultivation ponds. And uh, there's definitely a new, unique group of bacteria that's associated directly with the surface of algae. They seem to be very important. Um, they, they are affected. They, we know that they are associated. You need a certain group of microbes associated with the surface for high productivity. What's also very interesting, there's an excellent paper in Nature on this um, that some of the microbes that are associated with the rhizosphere are similar to the ones that are associated with the phycosphere. So there is a lot of work going in here and I think it's very important. I think there will be a lot of new developments once we understand how to you know, control and, and monitor the microbiome that's associated with algae in the cultivation ponds. Um, so a lot of metagenomics is all going on. We had a project going on that. Um, there's also a lot of transcriptomics uh, there's hope there will be some good uh, markers for different kinds of stress. So we'll be able to figure out what's why algae are not happy, why they're not growing. Genomics, um, we recently sequenced, not us, but Scripps Institution of Oceanography, they sequenced the genome of the Nitzia that we grow here that grows very well. And I'll have a slide on that. And then, um, a lot about just phenotyping. We know um, from the work that was done the last, I would say, 10 years, there was a lot of focus on producing high lipid mutants. And we've spent a lot of effort trying to generate high lipid mutants from the Nitzia that we grow because it grows so well. 
and we were able to generate them. But what we found out is all those mutants were not stable. And it's probably because diatoms are deployed and they have excellent, um, the excellent capability of repairing DNA. So uh, phenotyping and understanding the phenotype is very important as well. So uh, I'll just mention here, so the next year that I showed you that we cultivate here, it's, uh, it's a really, really interesting species. It's tolerant of different salinities. It can grow at a high pH. It can grow in the, uh, in the carbonate buffer, which is critical for us because that's how we add um, carbon CO2 to the system. Um, and lately we started testing with something what's called direct air, air capture which is uh, the idea that you don't have to be attached to the power plant to get CO2. You can, you can get CO2 directly from the atmosphere. And this happens when you can grow at a really high pH. So if you grow at pH higher than 10.2, um, you can use the ability of the algae and media to take CO2 directly from the atmosphere. And it's kind of a new area that everybody's super excited about. Uh, University of Toledo uh, isolated a green, a chlorella that's capable of um, growing at those high pH as well. And we found out that the Nisia that we've been working with also seems to have this capability. So um, if you know of any algae that are growing at really high pH, and I'm saying high pH, it has to be pH, 10.2 or more, we know that this one can grow at pH even up to 11. Um, those are potentially very good biofuels species. Um, so this is, yeah, uh, is deployed, no surprise, um, pretty big genome. We know it produces a lot of different proteins for uh, adhesion. And it has a lot of duplication in the glycolysis and fatty acid synthesis enzymes. That's very important. That's probably what's giving it the advantage in being the high producer, growing fast, and outcompeting other algae in the, in the pond. It also has many carbonate transporters and a lot of genes that are associated with carbon concentrating mechanism, which is, again, probably that's this is the area why it's capable of growing at really high pH. Um, we know very little about it. This is like a new field. We, I think the work on this just started um, in the last year or two, and we're super excited. What are we going to learn about the species and to try to understand why, for example, why this one is doing so well in our system. What's interesting about Nisias, and I don't know this, but it's also very uh, tolerant, I'm not tolerant, is very resistant to contamination. So usually in many cultures, you'll see that, that there's just no other algae and no other organisms um, coming into the culture, only a few. And I almost suspect that Nisia has an inability to control what's coming in to a point. So other areas of research is what I was already mentioning, growing algae uh, on a CO2 that's coming directly from the atmosphere. Um, so if you know of any algae that grow at really high pH, there's a lot of interest in that. Uh, another area is breeding. And um, I know there's a lot of work going on chlamydomonas, and we have been working on, on breeding diatoms. We were trying to breed this Nisia, which is not easy. But the idea is it's a diploid organism. And what we hope for is that you'll be able to breed strains from different locations. And you know, ideally, you'll develop a strain that has some really good capability of producing lipid or it's a very fast grower, just like breeding of wild uh, strawberry from North America and South America resulted in strawberries. We kind of hope for the same in the diatom world. Uh, there's a lot of interest in co-culture, and co-culture is interested, understood in really uh, broad way. So not only cultivating multiple species together, but primarily cultivating algae with, uh, with the right bacteria or the rather microbes that would help it, uh, that would help the culture to stay healthy. Pest management, um, the system uh, that we work with, so if you try to grow algae 
in open pond system in freshwater or um, seawater, you end up with a lot of contaminants. The system that we work with is carbonate based system and it has high pH and those conditions of high pH, just like in cultivation of spirulina, they prevent a contamination with other species and with pests. But even though you still end up with some contamination and some problems and trying to understand how to manage the pests, just like in agriculture is very important. And another big part is um, first people thought they're going to take the hologa biomass, hydrolyze it and uh, produce uh, biofuel this way. This is not the right way to do it. The economics of the process is just not there. So you have to be able to separate the oil and the protein and other products and kind of make commodities from all of them. Um, with the diatoms, there's additional advantage and disadvantage. They need silica for their cell walls. So you have to add silica to the media, which is additional cost. But you also end up with the product. You end up with the cell walls after you strip them of lipid and protein. And potentially, the cell walls are a product. Or you can just dissolve them. Um, another area that's very important is chemistry um, extraction, coming up with the way to economically extract oil from algae is very important. We also want the process to be clean. So traditional approach was hexane, just like it's done with the soy oil. It's, they use hexane to extract it. Um, we need the process to separate oil from proteins. Um, the drying process is, is takes a lot of energy. So coming up with alternative or modified drying processes is important. And for cultivation in open ponds, the cost of liner is very high. So there's uh, research going on in developing new liners for the ponds and making them more affordable because this will reduce the cost of production of building the facility, which will be huge. Um, I know that at some point people thought you can grow in ponds that were not lined. Yes, algae will grow, but we found out you end up with a lot of contamination problems. You can't clean the pond after one batch was cultivated and the residue just is a source of contamination and pathogens for your algae, which is not something that's working well and results usually in low productivity. And then big component is engineering. So uh, there's a lot of effort into designing the ponds. Um, a lot of effort into developing new drying process. And I have it under chemistry and under engineering because both components are there. Harvesting, the company I work with already developed a really cool harvesting system that's filtration by that's very economical. It's using 10% uh, of the energy that the centrifuge is using and it's 100% efficient. It's really, it's being a breakthrough for the algae industry and it's excellent. And it's what's important with it is also you can scale it you can scale it up. So often people come up with really cool technologies, but unfortunately you would never be able to scale them up. And then another area that um, we're very interested in, we don't work much in it, but um, a big engineering component is developing instrumentation for monitoring uh, the culture and for detection of any kind of problems that algae culture has. Mm. So what's the future? So I think algae is the future. They are going to provide the next generation um, green technology for production of food, for production of feed and production of fuel. And I think what's going to happen first, we'll see alcohol production um, being used for, for production of, of food and production of feed. And I think the fuels will come next because fuel is the cheapest commodity and it's really hard for algae fuels to compete with, um, with petroleum. And as you know, the price of petroleum has been going up and down like crazy. So uh, I think at this point, algae-based uh, lipids are probably like more $300, $400 a barrel. Um, we're trying to take it down to 200. Uh, but I think it will be, it will take major vectors and a lot of time to get it to lower plus price point by than that. And it'll never be at 40 or $50 per gallon. But I think if you add to the process, the 
environmental impact, you know, alcohol technology is very clean. It's using the CO2 from the power plant or from the atmosphere, what we hope for directly. I think this will happen. Looks like it's a really new area that will work. Um, you can 100% recycle the media. You use water, and I know that some people are saying you can use seawater. I was trying to explain why I think seawater or salty water is not a good option because you have to dump the water after you use it. But I think the way to do it is using, um, using fresh water and just taking in mind that you can produce so much more with the amount of water that is being used. And especially with the climate warming and the shortage of water, I think this is a great alternative for the production of food and feed. So what do we need? We need more technologies. And um, all those technologies are developed kind of on the edge of different disciplines. Like I was mentioning, it's all between biology, chemistry, and engineering. And um, all of those advances are needed to bring the price of alcohol-based biomass and algae products close to the price of the commodities on the market. Um, I think at this point in the development of the technology, we're not 10 times more like we used to, but we're still probably three times more than other commodities. And we're getting there. And I think the important next step is building a large facility uh, where you can test all those technologies. Also, what always worries me, we've always worked with those small facilities. Um, we probably don't understand all the problems that will happen when we start working at larger facilities. And like I mentioned before, the, the size of the farm has to be probably around 300 acres of the wet surface area for it to produce enough biomass to, to be able to, for this biomass to go to even a small refinery to produce fuels. And the bottom line is, I think the items are going to be in the next green revolution. Keep in mind when the first green revolution happened, which is application of fertilizers, pesticides, and um, new genetically modified crops, this resulted in increase in production of two and a half times. In case of algae, it's going to be increasing production almost 10 times, when you, especially when you look at production of protein per acre. Um, so I think this this will be this will be it. I think we'll have not only biofuels, but we also have the biomass for food and biomass for animal feed. And I think the first product that's going to happen is the, the use of alcohol biomass for production of aquaculture feeds, like for production of salmon or shrimp. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aga, for your wonderful presentation. Um, folks, if you have a question, feel free to type those in into the chat box and I can ask our speaker here. Um, we already have a few questions um, and I'll let you know the first one here is from Edna. Um, how do you determine that a diatom species or genus is good for cultivation? Um, in addition to oil or protein concentration, do you use trial and error with many different species? So um, when I started for working for the industry, and especially when I work for General Thomas, which is an engineering company, um, usually the engineers have an idea how the cultivation system is going to look. And of course, the system does modify it all the time. But, uh, you know, the, they already had in mind this, uh, you know, how the media will be composed. Uh, they knew how the carbonate buffer has to be made. Uh, they have understanding of the system of pumping that will be used. Um, so you need the strains that can, first of all, survive the pipe pumping, can grow in carbonate, is tolerant of high pH, and is tolerant of uh, certain temperatures. So in Hawaii, but I not only work in Hawaii, I also work in Texas and in California. And in the summer, it's a huge problem. It gets really hot. And the, the culture temperature in the ponds is going to be getting close to 38 centigrade, 36 centigrade. So what we found is you have uh, strains for the winter and strains for the summer. And the summer strains have to be tolerant of those high temperature 
Um, another area that's of interest, there is not much work going on right now, but um, we know that especially at high temperature, respiration and losses at night are a problem. So there's probably another area that will be addressed, uh, addressed in the future. So yeah, it has to survive the pumping in case of our system has to be tolerant of carbonates and it has to be tolerant of high pH. And on top of this, it has to be resilient to contamination and also has to be, of course, producing lipids and has to have a good protein composition. Great. Um, as a follow up to that, I wanted to ask you, you know, um, I was very interested that your most successful um, diatom species was Nichia's. Um, and I was just curious, you know, you're using these raceway um, systems to grow them. Um, and typically, Nichia's are benthic species. So um, can you speak to why that is there like a biological reason for why that one would do better than like a planktonic species? Um, so I've, I've spent a lot of time bioprospecting and looking for strains that, um, that will grow in the condition that my engineering team, so they pretty much told us, okay, this is what you have to grow them and find something that will grow in it. And, um, and has to survive the pumping. So what we found is, this Nitsia, yes, is benthic, but it can also be um, tycoplanktonic. So if the flow is fast enough, it will grow in suspension. And it's interesting, um, even, even if you take a classic benthic uh, Nitsia and you keep growing in, in suspension, you know, it will eventually start growing in suspension. But I think because it's not a classic planktonic species with a very thin cell wall, that's why you can survive all the abuse. Um, another thing that why, and I just digressing here, but another reason why diatoms are really good because it's easy to extract oil from them. All the greens have really thick cell walls, you have to crack them and everybody knows works on diatoms, you know, diatoms are like a box, you just have to open a box and it's relatively easy to do it and easy to extract oil. So the process of extraction is simpler than in case of green algae. So yeah, I think strains that the algae that you can make psychoplanktonic um, are better. Classic planktonic algae are just not going to grow. I see. Uh, here's a question from Jan. Um, do you know of any analyses that uh, completely account for all costs? Um, for example, production and in environmental externalities um, comparing fossil versus algal fuel production, um, such as life cycle and real cost accounting. So for algae, life cycle analysis is uh, part of every department of energy project. And um, I know all the reports from the Department of Energy are public. And I know the department, so the data I showed were from 2011. This is a really good paper that kind of goes from this true life cycle analysis and full techno-economic analysis of the production. Um, uh, I know that the company I work for, we have the cost model that we look at, I would say almost every two weeks, we look back at the cost model. And every time we try to figure out which area is of importance, but I know that our cost model is not public, but I know that Department of Energy has some public cost models. I've never seen anybody look at the environmental impact and the cost of environmental impact, which I think would be very interesting of algae production and um, compared with fossil fuel production. Um, I think it will be huge. I think if you address that cost, it would make uh, in reality, algae-based biofuels much more economical if you add the environmental cost of fossil fuels. One thing I've read about um, in terms of offsetting those environmental impacts is using wastewater as a nutrient source. Um, have you looked into that area, potentially using algal biofuels as uh, the production of it to remediate nutrient pollution? Yes, so it's not our company that's working on, but companies that work on that. And um, what they are doing is they take, uh, so when you take wastewater, Yes, you can produce biofuel, but there's nothing else you can do with leftover biomass. So you have to use hydrothelmar liquefaction to process all biomass of, into, 
into fuel. You can't use the biomass produced using wastewater for a human or animal feed. So that's the problem. Uh, but I know that after you go through hydrothermal liquefaction, you have nutrients left and those nutrients you can now use for production of alcohol biomass and fuel for fuel and for feed and for, for food. So yes, you can do it. I look at it as like a parallel technology um, with different goals in mind, but uh, not if you want to produce food and fuel. I'm um, sorry, food and feed. Uh, here's a question from Becky. Uh, in many areas of the world, fresh water is a limited resource. Do you have ideas for addressing that issue? And uh, she says that much work in New Mexico has focused on saline water bi biofuels because of freshwater scarcity and high evaporation rates resulting in saltier water. So I would just say that the technology that my company works on is one of the technologies and um, it does require fresh water and the key is that you're producing so much more for the same amount of water as compared to uh, other crops um, so you yes you can grow on saline water and as i was mentioning the, the problem is compensating compensation for evaporation so every time people look at the algae farm they say oh it's so much water you have to put so much water in those ponds. And the reality is the water that you use to charge ponds is only a fraction of the water that you're going to use to compensate for evaporation. So majority of the water used at the farm is compensation for evaporation. So if you have only salty water available, you have to use this salty water to compensate for evaporation. And um, when I work at General Atomics, we actually had a project that looked at that. And we found out that usually after around uh, 20, 30 growth cycles, your water is too salty to grow anything in it because as your salinity goes up, your productivities are going to go down. And now you have to keep rotating species that are tolerant of more and more salty water. So it makes the process more complicated. At, at the end of it, you still have to dispose of the of the remainder super, super salty water. Um, so Yes, you can recycle the water a few times, but you can't 100% recycle everything. It's definitely a possibility, but I think what people should focus on is if it's a traditional aquaculture, I'm sorry, if this is a traditional agriculture, you are producing, you know, one ton of protein per, per amount of water use. If it's an algae-based production, you're producing 20 times as much protein per the same amount of water use. So it's a huge water, the technology just saves a lot of water. Great. Uh, uh, here's a question from Mark um, about outdoor pond production. What are some of the realistic geographical and climate limitations of that kind of production? So uh, with this system, we obviously need water, but keep in mind it's a fraction of the water that we, we would use for our agriculture. And um, the place where we're located in Hawaii, um, keep in mind it's a research facility and the land is very expensive in Hawaii. So probably Hawaii is not going to have a lot of algae cultivation farm. It was more a question for a department of, of defense, can you do that? Um, but uh, with the original system, cultivation system that we started with is when you were dependent on the CO2 coming from the power plant or cement plant or brewery then you are you have to be attached to the to some kind of source of uh, co2 with this new idea that you can grow completely decoupled from the power plant um, i think the places where you can locate those farms is just becoming more and more and again the areas we're looking at is is former lands that were used for agriculture that were simply abundant so like the farm our farm in hawaii is in the former sugarcane field. They simply that they, they stopped producing it because it's not economical anymore to produce sugarcane. And the soil is pretty much, uh, it's being used for agriculture for so long, it's just not a very good soil. And there are lots of areas like this in the US and in the world where people used to, the, the area used to be used for farming. Now there is less rainfall and less water and you can't use it for farming anymore. 
So you could potentially use those areas and use, you know, a tenth of the area to produce or the twentieth of the area to produce the same amount of biomass and use only part of the water. Because when I worked in Pecos area in Texas, all this area is depending on uh, mostly groundwater for for irrigation. And if you can use the same amount of water produce much more biomass, that's probably the way to do it. That's why I think it'll be a next green evolution because of huge water saving option. A question from Karthik is, are there any companies globally that uh, make commercial production, do commercial production of diatoms for biofuel or other products? Um, so, uh, I know people produce diatoms for aquaculture feeds and they produce aquaculture strains. They don't produce them for live feeds, but they produce dry feeds and there are a few of those companies. Um, I know there are some small production batches for uh, nutraceuticals. I know that uh, there is a weight loss medication that's produced from the pigments from a diatom from the pheophyton. And honestly, that's all I'm uh, aware of. And maybe people know more than I do. <laughs> cool. Um, here's another question from Jan. Has anything been done lately with use of water-based algal suspensions directly as fuels in diesel type engines? I have no idea. I'm just thinking it would take, you would, I don't think it will be a suspension, it will be more like a slurry because you need a certain energy density in there and you would probably have to have a giant fuel tank to do it. You know, the beauty of oil or petroleum that it's such a energy dense uh, product and the reason algae produce it is because they, we stress them with limiting them with silica or with nitrogen they can't divide and they're constantly bombarded with light and they have to do something with all this energy and that's why they produce lipid. So um, I don't know if you could put water suspension and I suspect it doesn't have the energy density. Uh, another question um, is you mentioned contamination by herbivores. Are there problems with bacteria and viruses causing, causing diseases? So that's a great question because that's what we work on right now. Um, we have this project in collaboration with Scripps Institute of Oceanography and Craig Venter Institute. And we're actually looking at bacteria and at viruses. And especially this was my first project working on viruses. It was a huge eye opener for me. Um, working with viruses is really hard. We have to prep all the samples for them. Um, we know that Diatoms have uh, a lot of RNA-based viruses. Um, the green algae that are used for fuels, we know there are more DNA viruses associated with those. Uh, we suspect that sometimes when our cultures stop growing well uh, or has what we call the health issues, it could be driven by a diatom. Um, Lisa Ziegler, with who we work with from Craig Venter, demonstrated that uh, this um, extract from the culture that stopped growing uh, had something that was smaller than bacteria that caused the culture not to grow well. So uh, we know it's there, it's at its infancy. We're just trying to figure out what it is. So I hope from the project that we have right now, there will be, I'm sure Lisa is going to publish something on on the viruses that are affecting the algae. But for now, we know that it's mostly RNA viruses associated with the diatoms and more DNA viruses associated with the, with the green algae. And for bacteria, we know that there are definitely no bacteria associated with the, directly with the cell. And there are other ones that are more in suspension. And there are definitely some bacteria that are bad players. And there are bacteria that work as probiotics. We've tried to do some experimental work on that. It's, it's really hard. It's really hard to take one bacterium and try to show that it has an effect um, and try to translate it into outdoors. And the biggest problem we have, we know that there are around, for bacteria, around 400 OTUs associated with our cultivation ponds. Um, 
we also found that depending on species you grow, you're going to have completely different bacterial flora associated with that pond, even if you have ponds right next to each other. So there is definitely, definitely a possibility for contamination to move from one pond to another, but the each alga that we cultivate develops their unique bacterial, bacterial flora. That's why I think um, the nitsia that we grow is so resistant to contamination because it's controlling well what's, what it grows with. Now it's, a, it's, it's, it's an open book. We, I, we're just learning about it and it's, it's, being super, it's being super exciting, but we definitely can see if the culture stops growing, we have a kind of like a waterfall of different bacterial species showing up and we can see the signal before we even see the uh, drop in productivity. So yeah, that's a huge open book and we know very little about it. Very exciting area. I have a question about a different kind of contamination. Um, are there risks um, with uh, perhaps some of these algae that are being uh, cultivated in these systems to leave these open ponds or raceways and enter into natural ecosystems, waterways, and potentially become like a nuisance algae? So, um, and I see that people talk the media is the, I, I, I've just seen people talk about Xerox media. So yeah, the media that we use is similar to Xerox media. So uh, this is a very harsh, high pH media. So you look for algae that can tolerate that. And um, this farm has been in operation since 2009 in Hawaii. Um, the species that we grow are native species. They were isolated locally. We tried some of the species that were important from the mainland. We always work with Department of Agriculture before we introduce any new species. So far, we didn't see any issues, but the bottom line is usually the species that you isolate locally are going to do best in the, in the conditions you're growing in. And if you import things because of this harsh high pH environment, I think those species are less likely to contribute to the, to the problem because there are not many of those highly alkaline environments. I don't know what would happen if you put the ponds in, this, in the environment that naturally has those high pH system. I don't know, I think you, you form those very specific growth conditions for the algae and you cater to the species you're growing. This is a very intense agriculture. You babysit those ponds three times a day. You feed them multiple times a day. It's a, it's a very high intensity process. So, um, and that's why those strains are doing so well. I think once they get released to the natural environment, nobody's going to make sure they're growing well. And I think the other species are just going to take over. And we, we don't worry about it. We don't worry because we, you know, we see blue greens come into our ponds. Um, but when you look at, for example, cultivation of spirulina, spirulina has been cultivated all over the world. And I don't think it, there's any documented situation where it was introduced into environment and caused problems. So I think it can be done safely. Um, and, you know, recently there's been lots of attention and research on harmful algal blooms. Um, do you have um, experience or thoughts about potential toxin producing algae being cultivated? So everything that we grow is screened for toxins. Uh, we will also worry about contaminants coming. So, so far we've seen only once a contaminant that was producing a toxin. We had once a blue grain that was producing a toxin and we usually just catch it really, really quickly. And there are lots of excellent monitoring technologies that came from the toxic algal blooms that are allowing us to do that. Let's see, I'm looking for some other questions here. Um, there was a question from Peter, are there any recommended economics reviews? And I was not sure if that he meant uh, literature reviews. Uh, so I think the best are the reports coming from the Department of Energy. Uh, I don't think there was any other, there were any other papers after 2011. Um, so honestly, I don't know. Um, the thing that's, that's I'm, I'm sure people are aware of, so Department of Energy, when they have their reviews of the projects, those reviews are public. People usually don't, don't disclose a lot of details because the, it's, it's, I mean, anybody from the, from the street can kind of log in and do it and be part of the review. But I know people talk more and more about economics. 
Um, I don't know of a current published paper besides the one I had in my presentation from 2011. I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are more papers coming because there's a lot of research going into economics of the process. Mm -hmm. Then one more question I see here is, have you tried to cultivate marine diatoms or do you focus mostly on freshwater? Uh, okay, so the Nitsia de Pigrao was isolated from a tidal pond. So is it freshwater or is it marine? <laughs> so um, I found, I've done lots of bioprospecting and I found that algae that are coming from tidal areas that expose those huge changes in salinity and usually also huge changes in temperature are the best sources. This is where we where I got the most isolates from. I also found some good isolates in, in natural spring areas that have salty water and form those little ponds where, where you have, those, again, huge changes in salinity and huge changes in temperature. So any environment that results in changes in salinity and changes in temperature is potentially going to have those strains um, that are tolerant of those conditions. Flood, flood oh, sorry. Life in Hawaii. <laughs> um, so uh, another system that are of interest, and we are actually working with Mark Edlund on a new project now, are the uh, areas that are naturally high pH and are naturally high in carbonate. I know that a strain that the University of Toledo has, uh, chlorella, was isolated from uh, one of those high carbonate lakes. So those areas are definitely of interest. And those are also the areas where people find spirulina. They all came from high carbonate lakes. Well, we are now out of time. Um, I want to thank Aga so much for her presentation and answering all of our questions. Um, Everyone, thank you for joining us today and hope you can join us again in a two weeks. We'll be back at our regular time um, and it will be about the genus Navicula. So we'll see you then and thanks again, Aga. Thank you, aloha.